metal polishing is a dirty business. And while attending truck shows over the years, I've often wondered about those guys whose clothes and faces were covered in what looked like soot. Polishing on trucks days before the show started, they never seemed to have time to stop and chat, so I never really learned anything other than that they make the truck shiny. I thought that it would be interesting to dig deeper into the mindset of a metal polisher. Big Rig Polishing Supplies agreed, and a documentary was planned around Wisconsin's Wapan Truckin' Show. Following Evan Stagger, his crew, and family for several days revealed that it's totally a dirty job, but the passion for making things shiny and providing for its family outweighs that. After viewing this documentary, hopefully you will look for the shiny side of things regarding other upstanding metal polishers that make America's rig shine as they roll down the road. For me, it was a pleasure to get to know Evan, not for what he does, but for who he is, and witness the passion that he puts into his craft firsthand. This is his story. He's a stand-up guy. You know, family man, small business owner, struggling to get ahead. Um, I can relate to that. I see him as probably the truest person I've ever met. Um, he gets up every morning, he goes to work, he works hard. So, who are you? <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> I'm just a regular guy doing, a, doing something I love. I don't know trying to support a family. I grew up in a small town called Campbellsport. Tiny little town, everybody knows everybody kind of town. We lived on a farm. We had steers, so we didn't have to milk or anything like that. I had allergies, so I, I got out of a lot of the chores. And my parents, old fashioned, never been divorced. They've been with each other since right after high school. My dad was always a real hard worker. Uh, my mom was a stay at home mom. It was nice having mom home to raise us and be there for us for everything and my dad worked uh, a first shift welding job. He worked some hard hours to keep food on our table and a roof over our head and they pinched pennies as much as they could and made sure we went on a trip somewhere every year. That was our that was our big thing growing up was we always took one trip somewhere and my parents always made it educational. I mean we got to see a lot of the country. My grandfather was my best friend. We lost him a few years back. He was a, a farmer and he worked hard. He had diabetes. They told him he only had a few years to live, and he made it a long time longer than that. Him and I were close. He lived right down the street, so all summer long I'd bike down there. Growing up around him working hard and my dad working hard, I probably worked too hard, but at this point right now, I kind of feel like I, 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 there's no real words for how grateful I am and thankful I am for everything I've got, that nothing was really given to me. I've always had to, uh, work for everything, everything from my first car till the shop. It just, it doesn't fall in your lap. But some of the 18, 20 hour days I get yelled at by my parents a lot that I'm missing out on some of the family stuff, but I always try to make sure I still have some family time in there. Um, the long days working here take a toll on you, you start to miss the family a little bit. I've, I've got a pretty understanding wife and the kids definitely make up for it when I am home. The girls are always happy to see dad come home. But. I think it's 14, you can get a work permit. Um, I started picking stones for a friend of our family. Shortly after that, I started washing trucks at one of our local trucking companies. And uh, I fell in love with trucks. I don't know what it was, something, I don't know if it's because they're so big or they were customed or what it was, but I, I just kind of fell in love with the trucks. And everything from there on out just kind of gravitated towards trucks. Shortly before I graduated high school, I started working at Sparkle Wash in North Fond du Lac here, which is about a half hour drive from Campbellsport. So it was still close, um, but it was a regular full-time job. And working at Sparkle Wash and having so many local truck shows, I just started getting addicted to the clean and shiny trucks. I guess generally it doesn't make you any more money. I suppose some circumstances it could, but um, just a sense of pride, um, 
it's nice to have shiny things. It makes you feel good. You know, when you're going down the road and you're looking better than everybody else, it makes you feel good. It's more of a pride thing, I suppose. It just makes a guy a personal preference. It makes you feel better. They take pride in your in your job. Feel better about everything. You just feel good about going to work. You don't mind being gone if you're gone from your family or people give you a thumbs up or say that really looks nice means a lot to a person. I'd say it was right when I graduated, 2000. I had a couple buddies that. Um, we're going to truck shows pretty consistent. And I had seen some polishers out in the truck stop parking lot over the years. And um, I, I always was intrigued by what they were doing. You know, seeing them, watching them run a grinder and watching it go from dull to shiny was kind of cool. I always wanted to learn how to do that. And I'd, I'd go out once in a while and just ask a guy, you know, what, what are you using there? And they'd, they'd blow you off, you know, they didn't want to tell you. It's a pretty, it's an art form and uh, a lot of the guys didn't want to tell you anything. So a couple of my buddies that were into the show circuit at the time had said, uh, you know, we polish our own trucks. I helped them polish trucks and was instantly addicted. They ended up winning. They got first and second place in their classes. And seeing that trophy come home and knowing that I had part in helping them achieve that kind of sparked something inside of me, I guess. I don't know. We. It was something to do together, and I guess I didn't really mind. I was making money, too. <laughs> yeah, so. I don't know, we would just do it on this, like, because he worked at the truck stop, the the truck wash or whatever, and we would do it on the side. I stayed working at the wash for probably, uh, I think it was five more years before I finally decided that um, my business had taken off enough that I needed to either promote at the wash or I needed to put in my two-week notice and go full-time and um, I tried promoting and the boss, at the, the owner at the time said there, he just wasn't ready for that position. He knew I was polishing on the side, which wasn't an issue. I decided at that point in time that I was gonna switch doing polishing full time. So well, yeah, when he started, we didn't have a shop. We just went to the guys, the truckers' houses or like in his grandpa's yard, we did them or wherever we could. And then when we had our first daughter, he started doing it in our garage. And then we had our second daughter, he got the shop. So it's step by step. Yeah, in 2005, I quit my job, my full-time job to pursue the polishing uh, as a full-time gig instead of just a part-time deal. I married my wife and <laughs> bought a house. We actually had bought the house first, then quit my job, and then got married. It was, it was scary to say the least. It's kind of cool to see how much it progressed. Like, everybody's like, how is he going to do that for a living? Even me, it's like, you're quitting your job at the truck wash and you're going to polish trucks. And it was hard. I mean, winter would come and he would be, it gets slow and we'd get behind on our bills and then summer would come along and he'd get caught up and then you get behind again. But now, I mean, now he's busy enough. We make it through winter and yeah, it's, it's cool to see how, how much it's grown. My wife always tells me I worry too much sometimes, but I do worry about uh, not being able to provide sometimes, you know? I mean, there's no real, there's no real security in what I do. I mean. As far as it goes, polishing is a luxury. It's not a necessity. Um, and I've always treated it as such. I, I made it through the recession. Uh, I think 2007 was probably one of the toughest years for me as a polisher. I was, I was kind of focusing on some of the larger companies in the area thinking that was my answer to, get, to keep growing. And when the recession hit and times got tough, the big companies, I could I could have heard crickets from them. You know, there was there was no phone calls. Yeah, I'd call them. Hey, you got something laying around this week? No, there's nothing really here. But I, I'm thankful for that because at the same time, my small guys were still calling. I've really built a loyal customer base. I've got a lot of customers that I've had since 2000. 15 years this July since I polished my first truck. 
he treats everyone like family. It's it's really nice to do business with a guy, and you feel you feel comfortable giving him your money because you get quality work done when he's all finished. And you you just couldn't ask. He gets you in as soon as he can and schedules you, and he doesn't push you off. He does the best that he can for you. He treats everybody like you're somebody. He's a good guy. I became friends with him over the last few years, and. And uh, I guess I wouldn't have no, nobody else do it. His work is top of the line. He makes you feel good about going to work because you could have an average truck or average trailer or whatever, and he can make it look like brand new again. For me, a few of the customers that I had had from back in 2000 when I first started until 2007, I had known them for seven years already at that point, and they weren't calling as often. And, you know, just do the six wheels and we'll hit the tanks next time. A few of them, I just did it. I just, I just ate humble pie, you know, ate the product, and I, I, it, it bothers me only polishing half a truck. Because as soon as the half a truck goes down the road and people see it half polished, they're like, why didn't he finish the other half? And I never want to put people in that position where they feel like, they have to explain themselves and I don't want them to ever have to feel like they have to tell somebody they didn't have the money to do the rest. So I just did it for a few of them and actually funny story a few years back I actually had one of those customers that you know he was the guy that I could only get six wheels done or just two tanks done and I did the extra stuff and I got a check in the mail a few years back and it was a large sum of money and I couldn't figure out what it was for and he had already paid me for his spring polish and I called him up and I said, uh, I think your wife screwed up, she sent an extra check. He's like, yeah, yep. I said, well, no, you, you paid already in spring. And he said, no, um, I don't know if you remember all those years that you polished free stuff for me. He's like, I kept track of all that and I'm paying you back for that. I'm like, you don't owe me for that. That was just part of how it goes. And uh, he's like, no, he's like, y you, you worked for that money, you deserve it. He's like, now that I have the money, I'd like to pay you back. And it, it was just really humbling for me to know that a small time customer like that would um, remember stuff like that or take the time to write it down and figure out what, what it would have cost and taking the time to take care of that. And that moment was kind of an eye opener for me that no matter how big I get, I should never forget the little guy. I don't want it to sound cheesy, but when people come here to get polished, I try to treat them like family because they're supporting my family and they're supporting everything I have and the one thing I, that I really get a, a, a ton of enjoyment out of. He's not uh, the stereotypical polisher, I'd say. I'm not afraid to have him come in our our building and not worry about them coming back at night when you're sleeping, you know. There's a lot of polishers out there. Uh, there's a lot of guys just hanging out in truck stops, making a quick buck. And the polishing industry doesn't exactly have the best reputation for what it's worth. Um, there, there's a lot of um, truck stop junkies and um, guys just trying to make a quick buck for their next fix. And that gets transitioned into a lot of us, um, a lot of the straight shooters. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been in somebody's shop and they said, you know, I, I gotta stick around and wait until you're done. Um, or th they paid another polisher before they got the work done and they came back and the guy was gone and so was their tools or they came home and saw a guy, you know, doing drugs behind their building. It, uh, it's kind of aggravating knowing that we kind of get rolled all into that same ball. I, I come walking in and I'm all clean and people don't expect that. They expect a the guy that hasn't showered in two days and just completely covered in rouge. Or they meet you at a show and they expect you to be completely dirty at the show still. I like to promote the company and represent the company as, as much as I can. But if you're just getting started in the industry, put in the legwork. Don't, don't try to do just show trucks or 
just just the old nasty trucks try to diversify a little bit and do a little bit of each find yourself good products um, try to find yourself good customers um, cold calls and chasing other people's customers usually never works out to the benefit of anybody um, I used to do cold calls and nine out of ten people you call weren't gonna have you do any work um, word of mouth and people seeing your work is going to get you a lot more business. I've got a great prepper and a chaser. Prepper is a guy that uh, he is either sanding to get things smooth enough that I can cut them, or a guy that's cleaning wheels, getting the dirt and dust off them so that so we can start buffing right away. Um, pulling lug nut covers off the hubs or setting up jacks to jack them up. As you saw this week, we jack the wheels up and spin them. Uh, for me, it just makes a, I can keep a nice even pressure and shine across the wheel all the way around. If I'm not taking them off and roll them around the shop, I can leave them on the truck 90% of the time. A good prepper makes a, makes a good polisher look better for what it's worth. <laughs> um, cutting's a guy that's running a, a high speed grinder, whether it's a 3000 RPM or less or a 6000 RPM or more. The guy that's running the grinder is your cutter. It's the guy that's doing the preliminary shine. Your color comes right after. Uh, the guy that's bringing the high gloss out. You always finish with a chaser, a guy that's wiping down behind you or getting in the tight spots with some hand polish that you can't get into, like on a wheel. The valve stem's in the way. You can't get a buffer, an eight inch buff or a 10 inch buff. Some guys use 12 inch buffs. You can't get those buffs underneath the valve stem. So we use hand polish to get underneath the valve stem real real nice and tight so it kind of blends it up so you can't see a huge transition between where you polished with the grinder and where where you couldn't get in with the grinder a, a good chaser can kind of eliminate that big transition yeah when I first started I mean I wasn't even really doing a lot of high speed buffing it was just a lot of hand polish and just starting off once I started getting the hang of that and figuring out you know that I needed to get into all the nooks and crannies and tight areas that you know the shows were really picky, they were looking for a lot of that stuff. I just thought, you know, this was gonna be easy. And uh, once I started getting into the high speed polishing, high speed polishing was a completely different game. Like, you could burn the aluminum, you could leave lines in it. There's there's so many different variables to getting it just right. Um, the, wrong, the wrong temperature outside with the wrong rouges, the wrong humidity. I mean, too much heat, too little heat, too much rouge, not enough rouge, the wrong buff. Uh, whether it needed sanded or not sanded. There was just so many different variables that keeps your mind thinking every day, all day. When you start looking at it, all the things you have to keep straight, it, it's an art. I mean, to create a painting, you have to have the right brushes. To make a shiny wheel, you've got to have the right buffs and compounds. I don't know, I grew up on a farm, so that was dirty too, but this is, I don't know, it's just different. When I'm covered at the end of the day, perceptions of people in the public are, uh, have been everything from, there's a guy that works his butt off, to there's a homeless man. I've heard it all. Uh, when you're dirty like that, it, it makes it tough. When you, when you go to fast food restaurants and they send everybody out to the window to come look at you because you're so dirty that you think you worked in a coal mine or you're turkey hunting or something. I've been locked out of convenience stores before just because of the way I looked. I've been handcuffed and put in the back of a police car because my face didn't match my license. I don't mind getting dirty. It's, it's just part of the job. There's no, real, there's no real cons for me. It used to be irritating having people look at you funny. When I, when I first started off. But then there's those people that, that come up to me and they ask me, you know, I get the whole, you know, do you work in a coal mine? Do you, are you a chimney sweep? Those are the two biggest ones. But, you know, when I start talking to people and telling them, you know, well, I, I'm a metal polisher. What do you mean? I, I, I polish, I, I polish stainless and aluminum. And that's, this is what happens. And the shock on their face is, 
priceless. It's now it's just kind of who I am. Even in town here in Chilton now, a lot of the people know me more when I'm dirty than they do when I'm clean. So most of the guys will come up to you. It's like, I haven't been a long day. Yeah, yeah, it's been a long day. And when they see you clean, they're like, Evan, is that, is that really you? It's like, yeah, yeah, that's me. Wow, we don't see you clean very often. I'm like, yeah, I, I work a lot. I think they're just so used to it because it's always, that's what he's done. But other people, like my parents are like, oh, Evan's out mowing the lawn and he's all full of stuff. And their friends are like, who's the guy mowing your lawn? And I'm like, because oh, he does it all dirty. I'm like, oh, Evan. Or when he goes through the drive through and all the people come to the window, come look at how dirty he is. And I think some of them ask, are you a chimney sweeper guy or whatever? It's like, oh yeah, it's embarrassing at times. <laughs> you get that dirty from doing all of that. I just say every day, this is everyday thing for me. It has been for 13 years and I love it. And that's what kills them is when you, when you tell them that you love your job, but yet this is how you look, that's what completely kills them. They, they, they just, they don't know what to say. I don't know if I can see him doing this when he's older because it's hard on your body. Like I weed eat the lawn for a half an hour and my arms are shaking. He's like, that's what it's like all day. I'm like, I could not do that. But health risks, as long as you don't let the stuff soak on you for 24 hours or more, as long as you get a shower within 24 hours, there's, there's no real health risks that have been conclusive. Um, Cheaper products, there's there's other risks with iron oxides and uh, chromium oxides and stuff like that getting in your system and your even aluminum dust getting into your system. Um, we wear the full face respirators. I always preach respiratory safety. I don't think there's any real pros to being to being completely dirty as far as that goes. Uh, makes makes uh, cleaning your shower a whole lot more interesting. That's for sure. pay to clean anything like that's why we don't have white walls at all in our house not a single wall is white because anything he touches is dirty I mean even in a in my car and he's not even in my car that much or if I take the girls to the shop their shoes are dirty their clothes anything they touch they get a kiss from him when I go to visit him it's on their face or on their hands or but he, he has white vehicles <laughs> I bought a new truck this year and first thing I did was put seat covers on it because hopping in and out of it, the stuff comes with you. No matter, no matter how much you try to clean yourself, the stuff still goes home with you. Um, when I get showered up and I go home and I lay in bed, you, you still see it sometimes. The spots you can't reach on your back, they, they, they come along home with you. But uh, we're Still in that transition period where we're still growing yet and my laundry still goes home. My wife still takes the laundry home to, to get them nice and clean. I bag his up, bring it home, drag it down to the basement, I wash all his, then I have to clean out the wash machine before I do any of our good clothes. So, I don't know. I'm Like my sister, she's very picky about things. She probably would not even let him wash clothes in her <laughs> or shower or step in her house. That, that dust and dirt goes right along home with it. So in our basement, there's a spot where my dirty clothes go that uh, has got a nice black ring on the floor that you got to sweep up or mop up once in a while just to get rid of it all. I'm glad he has a shower at the shop now because I don't have to scrub the shower every time he showers. I had always talked about putting a shower where I worked to uh, try and alleviate some of that from going home. My wife hated that I showered at home and our, our tub was always black. When you, when you wash, no matter how much you rinsed it down when you were done, you could clean every day and not keep your tub clean. So first thing I did when we, when we bought the place was made sure we installed a shower so we could keep the mess here and contain it here, at least try to contain most of it here, 90% of it anyways. So now it's nice because our, our bathroom at home stays clean and our walls at our house, if we ever put them back to white, would decide to stay white. Which would be nice to get rid of some of the excess color in the house. <laughs> oh, 
like I didn't see him all week. He would be gone before I even got up in the morning and then I, I don't know, I'd be in bed by the time he came home. I would stop in and give, like take him lunch or supper or whatever and that's the most we see him. <laughs> so it's just, it's just really busy and then when he goes on the road too, it's kind of hard for us but he always says it's worth it, it'll be worth it. <laughs> when we bought the shop last year, my wife still had worked a, a regular full-time job and we had just had our second daughter and I didn't like having to get a babysitter all the time. Not that I didn't want somebody else raising my kid because that doesn't bother me, but I just wanted better for the kids and I wanted better for my wife. I mean, she had a good job. She was a CNA. She loved it, but the money wasn't always there. He's like me. He focuses a lot on his work, but the main focus of that work is because he's got Tammy and, you know, Lacey and Lexi. He's focused on them all the time. You know, the work is just something that he does. That's how he pays his bills. Last year when I bought the shop, I hunkered down and put in some long hours and the business started to grow. And I, I told the wife that I'd prefer if she quit her job so that I could do this more and she could raise the kids. I was gonna try to still be there as much as I could. I know for the last year and a half, I haven't been there as much as I'd like to be. I try to still schedule some home time. I, I, it's funny, I'll go through my schedule sometimes and the wife's got days, days off penciled in for me that she wants me to take off just to spend some time with them. I, I know I'm a workaholic, but when I'm there with the kids, I always make it worth it. I started looking at life as more than just me and my wife and more as now we've got other, other people dependent upon us. When we had our second child, I just kind of, um, it, it really hit me hard that now I've got three people that depend on me and I knew the steps I was going to have to take to get there and I tried to prepare Tammy for some long days and some long hours to ensure that, you know, in, a, in another year that, you know, I could hire some guys in and be able to cut back my hours a little bit and we could start to enjoy what, what we've built. As far as a husband, I'm, I'm always, I always try to be as supportive as I can of my wife. She's been there for me a lot. I, I try to be there as much for her as I possibly can. There's, there's a few times where we buck heads on stuff, but that, I, I feel like that's normal. But my daughters gave me a, a whole new perspective on life. My work goes all across the country on the, on the buses, but I've never been in a situation where my work's actually going to a show and there's people walking around and really looking at it. And that was gut-wrenching. I'm thinking to myself, that guy's looking at that truck. I did those tanks. I did that grill. Oh boy, did I do it right? Did they like it, you know? So going to, going to Wapan was, was definitely an experience. It was, it was nerve wracking, but it's one that I wouldn't trade because honestly, I saw a lot of smiles on the faces of people when they looked at those trucks that I know, you know, I helped on. Whether I did the stainless on them, whether I did a, a set of wheels, whether I did anything, I know I put my hands on that truck and, you know, it, it ended up, it ultimately made me feel good once I saw people looking at those trucks and smiling. It, it really, it did something for me that, you know, polishing buses hasn't done. I think this was the 26th year that uh, wapan has been putting on a show. There's been some really good years and there's been some lower number of years. I first started going, I think, in 1999. Um, I was a junior, just had my license. It was something to do for the weekend. Had a bunch of friends that, you know, were into trucks and 
um, as the years went on, the trucks started getting cooler and customized and I don't want to call it a party because it's not the proper word for it, but it got to be a big meeting place. Um, a, a lot of people just go for a good weekend. We've, we've also had some good years where the trucks that we polished were really good. I mean, we brought home a lot of trophies. There was other years where we didn't bring home anything. Um, this year was my first year judging, and I kind of look at it in a whole, a whole other perspective now. You know, when you start picking apart some of the trucks and you start looking at them, you start to see other things that you never looked at before. There's a lot of small things I see when I'm working. So I purposely made sure I didn't judge any of my own trucks this year that, I've, that I personally worked on, just because I know I'd be over picky. I, I usually look at all the little stuff. When you're, when you're polishing a fuel tank, you're always looking to see where the wires are on the lights, make sure they're not dangling down because a breeze off the buff will pull a wire right into the grinder and it'll hurt you in a hurry. So you notice all that stuff, if they're zip tied up or if they're just kind of dangling there. If, if the wheels are polished inside and out or if they're just polished on the outside. If they're missing paint in certain sections, if the graphics weren't spot on. It's all stuff that you, you think about while you're polishing the truck, but you never really think that a judge is thinking about that until you actually judge it and you're like, wow, there's a lot of stuff to think about when you're, when you're judging a truck. I guess going forward from this weekend even is gonna give me a different perspective of polishing show trucks knowing you know, some of the criteria that goes into it. At, at the show truck level, it's, it's really crazy. I mean, you gotta line up your valve stems with the lettering on your tires and make sure that your inside wheels and your outside wheels, the lettering on the tires is even and it, your zip ties are all straight. Um, your hose clamps are all turned in the same order. You know, it, it's all the little stuff that starts to add up at the show level, but uh, the shows like Wapan are impressive. It's no small feat to try and put together a big show like that and try and keep everything organized and still do good for a charity. For the last seven years, I've been with the same company. I mean, I've been buying the same Rouges. Uh, here in the Midwest, we get a lot of road salts and liquid road salts. Um, over the winters, our, our aluminum up here takes a beating. The, the truck drivers, it's, it's hell to try and keep everything straight and looking show quality or shiny. The rouges that I buy have silicones and beeswaxes in them that our polishes hold up better over the winters. I, I try to get most of the customers to do it twice a year, spring and fall. Fall to get it to hold over till spring, spring to make it look good all summer. Having the quality products that we use really has helped perfect my art. I've met with some metallurgists over the years that um, have helped me understand why the rouges and the buffs make things shiny, why they, why they do what they do. Um, sometimes a higher melting point rouge is gonna be better in hotter weather. Uh, with hotter weather, a low melting point rouge will just melt into a puddle on the ground while you're working. But trying to understand all that stuff is part of the art. You know, you gotta, you gotta try and bring in all aspects, like I said, with the with the painting with a paintbrush. If, if you're using a big fat brush, you're not gonna be able to paint the small tree. And it's kind of the same in the, in the buff world. If, if you're using a brown rouge and you wanna get a super high show cut gloss, it's not gonna happen because it's a heavier cut. and You'll get a good shine out of it, but you're not gonna get your show shine. Your, your greens and your, your blues are what you're gonna wanna use. I had been buying from Satex for a number of years. I don't know what happened, they just kinda disappeared and uh, I was kind of scrambling, trying to figure out what I was gonna do if I was gonna go with a different Rouge company. I didn't get any word if they were selling out or if they were just closing the doors. And that same friend of mine from Texas called me while I was at the Louisville truck show this year. This was the first time I had ever gone to Louisville. And he called me up and he said, 
you know how you've kind of been scrambling to find your, your, your Satex? I said, yeah. He goes, the company that I buy Rouge from is there in Louisville waiting to meet you. They bought out Satex. And my heart dropped. I'm like, oh, thank goodness. I don't have to change technique. I don't have to change pattern. I don't have to change Rouges. If they're gonna keep the same product and not water it down, I, I, I can buy the same stuff I've been using and wouldn't have, to, wouldn't have to make any transitions. It wouldn't slow me down. I can keep my speed up. I met Big Rig Polishing Supplies at Louisville and we instantly hit it off. Uh, Jill and Greg were running the booth. We, we started talking rouges, compounds, buffs, and uh, they said they wanted to send me some samples to try. And I said, I'm really interested in the, the Satex line. And they said, yeah, we, we bought out Satex. Um, I said, well, the part that worries me is usually when a company gets bought out, they usually get watered down. And they said, nope, we've got no intentions of watering anything down. I said, well, then I'd like to order a sample order of 200 pounds of each of the ones that I use. And as long as they're not watered down, I'm here, I'm, I'm game. But uh, I, I can't talk highly enough of Maverick and Big Rig Polishing Supplies. Oh, um, typical relationships between metal polishers. Typical ones, they're usually not good. There, there's a lot of, there's a lot of secrets, a lot of um, guarded, you know, um, we all have our own techniques, we all have our own tricks, uh, we all do things differently. Uh, what one person might see is, you know, absolutely gorgeous, the other polisher is gonna go, oh, dear Lord, he's not letting that leave. I know at least 100 other polishers in the US and around the world that um, I've met through a Facebook group, um, Metal Polishers on Facebook, that uh, was started by a real good friend of mine, Peter Williams. He started a group just to kind of get polishers together and kind of give them an outlet to share stuff with each other and just share the art form and the beauty of what it is. And through that group, I've met a lot of great people. A lot of us are friends via Facebook, online, things like that. We're friends, but you know, right down here, you know, there's there's still a lot of secrets that, you know, we're not going to share with the other guy because it's it's our art. You know, and being an artist, you don't give away your tricks of your art. You know, every polisher has their own signature. And that signature is what you leave on the metal. Okay, uh, your buff marks, um, your your color, the the cut pattern. Funny story. Uh, one of my buddies from Texas uh, called me up and he said, "I think I polished a truck today that you had done previous." I said, "Oh, really?" He goes, "It's funny because your cut pattern is almost exactly identical to mine." And he sent me a picture of his cut pattern. I said, "Yeah, you're about three degrees off of my cut pattern." And he said, "The only reason I knew." was because the guy told me he had gotten polished in fall, and this was spring. He said, I could still see your cut pattern, your, your color pattern, and it was still shiny. So he, he said he knew it had to be somebody using a long-lasting rouge, and it had to be somebody using the same identical cut pattern to his. And he gave me the company name, and I'm like, yeah, I just polished that guy in fall. And uh, he goes, I I'd love to polish trucks after you for the rest of my life. He's like, that was one of the nicest trucks I've ever had to polish. He's like, just for the simple fact that having the same cut pattern put on it time after time, it just gets shinier and shinier each time. And he's like, it, it cut out so beautiful. He's like, the, the driver was just ecstatic. And I, there, there wasn't any hate there. It was just straight compliments. Yeah, when it comes to polishing, polishing companies, it's rare that you get, uh, that you get two polishing companies that um, will interact with each other. I always try to tell everybody, especially my close friends, that you never want to look at the end of your hood. You always want to look as far down the road as you can and try to prepare yourself for where you want to be and which direction you want to go. Uh, I'd like to eventually have something that my kids could kind of take as their own and keep it going. Not 100% sure I want the girls getting dirty yet, but uh, I, I wouldn't mind them being able to, you know, run a place and
have something that's still theirs, but bring in talent and you know, kind of, kind of morph them into it. I'm, I'm sure one of the two girls is going to end up being a polisher, but uh, it, it'd just be nice to have something that they could still know that their their father built up and have something that they could keep moving forward with.